Welcome to Conversations with the Prime Minister. Tonight we continue our quest for wider involvement and people power at this sixth <coughs> edition of Conversations here at the Exodus Spaniard in Tunapuna St. Augustine. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. the Honorable Keith Rowley, to open this conversation with an introductory address. Thank you very much. A very good night to all of you present here, your large numbers. I'm surprised to see so many of you here. And those of you, those of you listening or watching at home, welcome to, maybe we should call this kind of event plastic chair. Because the most prominent thing that I could remember is walking in here and seeing this plastic chair. I think it's the same chair. The next time we're meeting anyway, I think I'll walk in my own chair so that it can look a little more um, upscale. This plastic chair looks kind of like you in the dock. And I'm about to be skewered by questions that I'm not supposed to answer. But I don't think that's how it's going to be tonight. Right? <laughs> we are very happy to have good weather. And on your behalf and on behalf of my team in the office of the Prime Minister, I want to thank the organizers of this function this evening and those who would normally be making good music in this yard, the Exodus Steel Orchestra. I want to thank you for lending us your pan yard tonight. If I was a panorama judge, I'll give you an extra point for this time tonight, right? But I want to make it very clear that um, what we do here tonight has nothing to do with Panorama and where Exodus place at the top or at the bottom because, you know, I'm really an invaders man in, in the West and Exodus in the East, but um, Exodus is recent. I spent a lot of my formative years in the corner here with gay flamingos, right? And Exodus came after and so on and so on, so I'm kind of home. But ladies and gentlemen, tonight is a very serious night, but we keep it uh, comfortable in that we are here to mind our business. You know, over the Christmas and New Year weekend, which happens to have been the first time that I've been in this country and not spend a part of that Yuletide season in Tobago. This year was the first. I had to spend the whole or a part of it in Tobago. This year, because I wanted to provide pertinent information to the citizens, I chose to use a different format to present solid, and I was saying incontrovertible information that would give you a better grounding in your understanding of our country. So with my team at the office, we worked over the Christmas and New Year weekend to present to you what we called It's Your Business. That was the title of the presentation, It's Your Business. Because without a good grasp of the nature of our economy and the challenges involved, we could be disadvantaged in some way. And you know, some people have a problem with the title mind your business. But I'm sure that you know that when you talk to somebody and say, mind your business, I was taught that since primary school, you're walking in the road, walking to school, and you're gazing at something, and cars or bus coming, mind your business. It means be aware, look out, pay attention. That's what this is all about. Pay attention. And tonight I want to reinforce that by saying to you, pay attention to what is being said to you, who is saying it to you? Because that seems to want to influence what is being said, as it always does. And also, where agendas might exist. Well, we've had a few days to listen to what was said about my performance as a school teacher. I was told that I insulted the population by going before a screen. But I can't help that because I taught for quite a 
uh, number of short years. But I'm sure that tonight, there are many thousands of people in Trinidad and Tobago who are a bit better informed and better educated with respect to the circumstances of our economy and its challenges, its prospects, and so on. An understanding that we can't please everybody, but we must try to. An understanding that the role of government in our lives in this country is too dominant. It could be a little less, but for the time being, the actions of the government directly impact your fortunes and your quality of life. And all we are trying to do in these kinds of interactions is to ensure that the population in Trinidad and Tobago is properly informed of our circumstance. So you can debate it, you can quarrel about it, you can be angry about it, you can be uh, upset or enthusiastic about it, but you must know what the issue is and the innards of it. This conversation tonight is one of many that we've been having since the general election and before, as a matter of fact, part of the general election campaign. I, as a contender for the position of Prime Minister, I did use this format to talk to people about the situation in the country and the prospects of a PNM government. And it didn't end on my election as Prime Minister. We've continued it, and since then, as Prime Minister, taking the government to, we, went, we had one of these in uh, Point Fortin, one in San Fernando, uh, well, Mount Hope, Diego Martin, so on. So we've been doing this in Tobago. So tonight we continue, and it's my, it is my intention to do this as time permits going forward. So if it so happens that we're doing this in the election year, then we missed the election in 2016, 17, and 18. And we'll continue to meet you in our quest to ensure that you are properly informed. And also, most importantly, in open fora like this, to allow you to put to us the kinds of questions that you think we should hear from you. And even if we don't have the answer immediately, we take note of what you say on issues no local or national. And also to make statements about where you stand on some of the issues. Because there are a number of issues which require your attention. So tonight, it is not for me to make long opening speeches. It is for you to go to one of those microphones and speak, I ask you civilly, because I know you'll do so sensibly, about the issues that interest you and the issues you would like to put to me for some kind of response and reaction. And we'll use the same format we've used before. If you put something to me, which I believe one of my ministers who's present here can give you a better answer or a more complete answer, I would call them and they'll put, go to a microphone and address that particular issue. The intention being that when you leave here tonight, you'd be better informed about some of the things, if not all of the things that concern you because this opportunity is yours. So let's get right down to it and open the floor to the early and brave ones. And I'm in the plastic chair. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. So just a refresher on the ground rules. Cell phones on mute or vibrate. Right, give your full name, ask your question, keep it tight, and then be seated. And just a reminder for those of you following us on Facebook and Twitter, that we also look forward to your questions and comments. You can send them to our Twitter account, which is at OPM underscore TT. Again, that's at OPM underscore TT, and on Facebook at Office of the Prime Minister. The first question. Um, good evening, Dr. Rowley. Um, my name is Rhoda Barrett, and I think a lot of people are aware that I work in media. My question would be related to the national report account that you would have given a couple of days ago. In it, you um, talked about changes in the concessions that were given to gas companies. I'm on this side, Dr. Rowley. Blonde hair, look for the blonde hair, all right. Right, in the, conversa in the national report, you talked about concessions that were given to gas companies. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's all right. Can, should I repeat? Yes, please. Right. So you talked about, in the national report, you talked about concessions that were given to gas companies because you pointed out that there had been a drop in revenue, right, uh, in terms of the taxes that were supposed to have been collected from the gas companies. So I want to have a sense of what were the changes in the concessions, who changed the concessions, and whether or not we have been able to regain the losses on those concessions. Okay, what I was referring to is a component of the loss of our prof petroleum profit taxes. We get revenue from the petroleum sector through a variety of legal mechanisms, one of which is petroleum profit tax. Another is supplemental petroleum tax, which kicks in if the oil price is above $50. Another one is royalty, where you pay a fixed price as you extract the item from the ground. Petroleum profit taxes are due to be paid on the profit that the oil companies make. It is that tax I was talking about. The concessions that were given were if the oil companies, the gas companies in this case, because really gas we're looking for more than anything else now, if those companies spend money to do a drilling program as they would spend money, that money is called capital expenditure, the cost of drilling the well and so on, capital expenditure. And what normally would have happened is that that expenditure, like every other business, can be written off against your profits. That is normal business. In the oil business, the way the law is structured, was structured, is that you will write off 20% of that in one year, then 20% in another year, and then 20% in another year, leaving your tax liability not fully intact, but a little less than it should be because you write off only 20% of your capital expense against it. The change that was made was this. We set out to make it more attractive to the oil companies to drill so that they will drill so that we will get more gas. That was the reason. But what the change is that instead of writing off this capital expense over time, 20% in year one, 20% in year two, and so on, that you could write off all of it immediately in the year following its incurrence. Meaning, because you were allowed to write off all of it in one year, when you do that against your profit, it leaves very little to be taxed. So while the intention was to encourage the companies to drill, and that might have been a good thing, it might have resulted in, as it, as it did, in drilling and so on, the spin-off of that was that you would have dried up your tax revenue by allowing them to write off that capital expense in such a short period of time. They did it knowing that that could be an effect, so it was limited to a short number of years. But as fate would have it, that just happened to have coincided with a collapse of the oil price and the gas price. So you were losing significant revenue through a collapse of the price at the same time that you had said to them, write off your taxes against our profits. Write off your, your, your taxes using your capital expenditure. And that's what it was. That concession allowed us to recover very little taxes. Is that any clearer? Do you understand that? It was a concession that was meant to make it attractive or more attractive to encourage the oil companies to drill. But it had the, the knock-on effect of reducing the amount of taxes that you will get. So that was a big a loss of revenue. And it was such that when I came into office as the new prime minister, within a matter of weeks, one of the meetings I had was with the head of BP, our largest gas producer. One of our largest, I think it was our, it's our largest revenue contributor came to tell me and to inform me that this reduced or minimal tax collection from them would remain in place until 2024. 
That was the first bit of good news I got from the, the energy sector in, 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 in Trinidad and Tobago as Prime Minister, that this significant reduction in revenue as a result of what was in place would result in us remaining with this minimal revenue until 2024. Whether they drew it down or not, the bottom line is that that was available to them. And the bottom line is that we had, in fact, put something in place. And that was one of the decisions that were made. There's another one that I will tell you about at another time. But as somebody would say, maybe not tonight. Next question, please. Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Pedro Mulrain. I'm right here. I would like to know what is the situation with the union's proposal for the acquisition of the oil refinery and its assets. And as you know, it belongs to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. They also, has, they also state about the, all the bullet payments to be paid, and the investors is willing to re-employ the retrenched workers, and, and so forth. I, I think it's a commendable effort. And, and I'd like to know what is the situation, and would you give them the opportunity in, in, so, in so doing? And if, if in the event that the proposal is not strong enough, would you come back to, to, to the citizen and help like um, Petro Train and you in terms of a one week program on, on um, TDT where the civil society could come and input onto that proposal, strengthen the weakness on the proposal and give it back to the union in order for the, to, to get the, the um, refinery and its assets because it's about people of Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, if you would recall, that the statement I made, which informed the country of the closing of Petrotrin's refinery, I did say that if the union is interested, the government would facilitate its acquisition. Let me make it quite clear. That was never an intention to give the refinery to anybody. It was to give an opportunity if they were so interested. Of course, the initial reaction was to go jump in a lake. However, the union did change its mind later and said that they want to consider owning or acquiring the refinery and operating it. Ladies and gentlemen, a refinery is a very expensive and technical piece of machinery. It costs billions of dollars to acquire and hundreds of millions to operate. So anybody who has the ambition to operate, to acquire one, is saying to you that I have the way of it all to raise the billions that are required to acquire and operate a refinery. That's the first thing. Second part of your question was whether we would give them an opportunity to make their proposal and to tweak it towards satisfaction. The last piece of correspondence that passed between me and the head of the OWTU, I made it very clear and made it available to the public that yes, we are prepared to give you first option, and that is going on right now, but the proposal that we, we would consider from you, which we are considering right now, must be a proposal that stand proper business scrutiny and robust examination. In other words, it can't be no, I like so, I think so, I want it. It has to be a proper business proposal which could see the refinery being safely operated, seriously operated, and properly funded to be a refinery. A refinery is not a chemistry set. It's a serious chemical operation that could have far-reaching consequences if it is not properly done. All along during this period, a proposal from the union is before the board. The board did not find the proposal acceptable, put it back to the union, telling them if they need help in, fabricate, in, in formulating one, they are were, they were willing to assist them. That process is going on right now. Because in a couple of weeks' time, towards the end of this month, the company is going to go out in open and ask for proposals from anybody in the world who has the wherewithal, financial and technical, and who have an interest in that refinery. Because we want the refinery restarted to be a refinery operating in this country, but not at the expense of our taxpayers. 
If there are other people who have money and their own oil or other people's oil that they want to do business, we have a refinery to talk to them about. But they are not in the loop yet until the company goes public and open. Right now, the company is only talking to OWTU, and that is their first option. And we told them, if by the time the company goes out to the public, they have not concluded an arrangement which is acceptable to the country via the board and the government, they could still put in a proposal when others put in their proposal. But at the end of the day, we'll examine their proposal to see if it makes sense, if they have the financing in place, if they have what it takes to acquire and operate a refinery. So we've given them all that we said and more. Prime Minister, we recognize the lady who has been here early waiting to make a question. Good night. My name is Natifa Mitchell. I have two main concerns. One is that um, I'm from one of the trouble areas. I used to live in one of those trouble areas. That sounds like Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and one of the things that I find nobody discuss is the dropout of school children, children like 13 and 14, and they are recruited by gang leaders to do the wrong things. And what are you all doing about the school dropout? And I find sometimes it's younger age, like 12 and so on. So I want to know what is the biggest, what, what you are doing about the, the school dropouts? And number two is that um, the eye clinic, it's still the worst clinic in Trinidad and Tobago. Since I was a child, when you go five o'clock in the morning, you're not coming out till any night. And there's no change. People discussing on the ground, you're seeing like a manipulation. The same person who telling you there's a long list for operation, when you go and pay for it private, it's the same person who doing the operation. So that is something you need to know what is going on on the ground. Thanks for your contribution. Well, uh, let, let me take the first part. Thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for your two questions. The first question about children, preteen children not going to school, let me make it quite clear that children are the responsibility of parents. And in this country, we still have a law, I think it's called the Truancy Act, where children under teenage are required to be in school, otherwise there's a breach of the law. Children who do not have identifiable parents or guardians are open to being deemed to be wards of the state. And there are a number of social support systems for children of that nature. So if there are situations like that, and we do know that there are some, because sometimes we see these children in the street, some of them either begging or doing business, either on their own behalf or on, their, on behalf of adults. And this is an area where if you see that happening, if you see something like that, say something to the authorities. We now have, in the last few years, we've made considerable progress with respect to children welfare in Trinidad and Tobago. And I can say now, without fear of contradiction, that we are better positioned now to treat with those issues with children than we were at any time in the history of this country. And considerable, considerable effort is put in it. We've got new facilities, and this issue is so important to this government that it resides in the office of the Prime Minister, and there's a minister responsible for that, and she's here tonight, Minister Ayanna Webster-Roy. So we are aware of those difficulties, and we are doing as much as we could, given our resources, but in that particular era of children welfare, in the last few years, last three or four years, this country has made a lot of progress, and we will continue so to do. The second question about the eye clinic, I must plead innocence, but I do have with me here a certain Minister of Health, who might want to comment on that very quickly? <laughs> Minister Terence de Alsing of St. Joseph, who is our Minister of Health. That mic is not on. Could you take this mic, please? Hello, good night to all, and Happy New Year to all. To the specific question that the young lady raised, this is something that has been going on in Trinidad and Tobago for decades. And under the stewardship of this government, we are breaking the back of that slowly but surely. You would agree with me that I spoke publicly that we are going to go on a cataract drive initiative to have all cataract surgeries done in the public sector. And we have done that. So 
the issue of conflict of interest is one that we are tackling surely. And if you have a particular issue, my assistant will come to you in a very short while. My assistant, take your particular information on your particular issue, and we will have it addressed. But we are breaking the back of this issue slowly but surely by doing more and more surgeries in the public sector. And I can tell you, the bill that we pay to the private sector has been coming down by millions of dollars each year. But we can't switch it on overnight. It's going to take some time, and we are working on your behalf. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We recognize the microphone on our left. Thank you. Good afternoon, Honorable Prime Minister. Good evening. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, in a previous presentation, you had mentioned that our income had dropped from 16 billion to 1 billion. Um, my question to you is, how, had, how did you manage, or how did we manage to maintain our current levels of employment and not suffer the job cuts in the public sector like what we saw happening in Barbados and other countries? I want to make it clear again, that specific reference to our income dropping from 16 to 1 applies to that particular component of our national income, petro petroleum profit taxes. But there were other revenue available, and those revenues, even though they too might have declined, we did have some revenue. And how we managed to do that is setting out to do more with less. We started on the appointment of this new government by appointing only 23 ministers of government as against 33. That was one way of dealing with it and setting the stage. If you may recall, I haven't heard it mentioned at all in recent times, but you may recall that soon after the first budget was passed, an instruction was given to all those who were in the public sector, the public service, to cut expenditure by 7%. I'm sure you forgot that. There was a 7% cut across the board on that instruction after the first budget was passed in the parliament. Then we set about to reduce waste. And heaven knows, public expenditure in Trinidad and Tobago has a significant component of waste in many forms and machinations. And we have been working relentlessly on reducing the chronic corruption that had become the establishment in operations of government in Trinidad and Tobago. Those three things have allowed us to do a lot more with what was available. Had we not gone along in that way, we would have done a lot less. We did not use retrenchment as a method of coping. What we did was to allow some contracts that came to an end not to be renewed if they were not priority contracts. And we did lose some jobs, but we did maintain as many as the circumstances permitted. Good night, um, Honorable Prime Minister. My name is Edi Stewart from the Nurses Association. There are many issues from, from, which, from which? The National Nursing Association, Trinidad Tobago Register. You're, you're, you're a nurse? Yes, I am. <laughs> yes. Um, many issues in the health sector, similar to the national security. But I want to focus on one particular issue, which was brought up in your last conversations with the Prime Minister in Mount Lambert, where a question was posed to you with regards to what is the justification for nursing personnel not being hired, one, and two, when they are hired, they are hired on short-term contracts, temporary employment, especially in the NCRHA. I would have written to you the very next day, because you had indicated at the meeting that you weren't aware that nursing personnel were not being given permanent contracts. We didn't receive any response. We wrote again, we didn't receive any response. So I'm forced to bring this issue here again. Um, so I'm asking a specific question, specific to NCRHA. Why is it? where NCRHA, through their own records, and I know you're a man of statistics, is showing that there are over 200 nursing vacancies in the institution 
it is causing crisis. If you leave here, or when you leave here, I would hope you could walk through the Eric Williams Medical Complex, and you will see there's one nurse, or for the most two nurses, on that night shift or evening shift. Nowhere else in the world you will see that type of quota system, patient to staff ratio. Generally it's one to four, one to five. In Trinidad and Tobago, it's one to 20. There's nowhere in the world you could give quality nursing care. Nurses are burnt out, frustrated. And NCRH is giving them continuous temporary employment, no gratuity, and all of a number of injustices. So I want to make sure you are aware of these issues. Yes, as I said, there are many other issues. Um, but I will focus on this issue because I really would like a response. Why is it that the government of Trinidad and Tobago feels that nursing personnel are not essential? Because they'll never do police, okay. they'll never do fire, all of these. I got, I got your point. Let me just make it very clear. I, I can't recall receiving the correspondence that you sent to me because had I received it, I certainly would have addressed it because what you have raised there is a very important issue. And I would like the minister to respond to it, please. Right here. Thank you very much, and thank you, President uh, Stewart, for your, for your question. The issue of employment of nurses and doctors and everyone in the RHAs goes like this. We have a budget for the health sector of approximately $6 billion per annum. Of $6 billion, 60% goes towards recurrent expenditure. That means $4.8 billion goes towards recurrent. The biggest chunk of that recurrent is salaries and wages. That just leaves me with 1.2 billion to see about dialysis, heart surgery, purchase of drugs, everything else. The RHAs are making every attempt to fill as many vacancies as humanly possible within their budgetary constraints. It may not make perfect sense to fill all vacancies, use up the whole six billion dollars in salaries and then I have nothing left for drugs, nothing left to pay $140,000 per annum to dialyze one patient, nothing left to pay $250,000 to give one person triple bypass surgery. So health economics determines that of your six billion, you choose wisely as how, choose wisely as to how you allocate your resources. The RHAs, all of them, are doing their very best. What we are doing in hiring is hiring as many specialist nurses, specialist doctors, because those are the crunch points. In keeping with a recurrent of 4.8 billion, and I give Mr. Stewart, <coughs> President Stewart, the assurance that he has the heirs of the nurses on the boards. He meets with them or ought to meet with them every quarter. I made those arrangements. He has the option to meet with the National Director of Nursing, a position which we filled, which was vacant for seven years. He meets with the CEOs. So he, we, we have all these avenues for mutually uh, uh, you know, agreeable discussions on the way forward. But before you get the microphone up, are you in a position for the benefit of those who are gathered here and the citizenry at large, to indicate what kind of establishment numbers we have and what proportion of that establishment is at any one time having filled bodies? Um, what, what, what vacancy levels do we carry? Prime Minister, as far as nurses are concerned, there is a significant amount. I don't have the exact amount right now, but there are vacancies. But we fill those vacancies based on two bases. One, availability of funds and vacancies. We would like to fill all the vacancies, but if I do that, I take up my recurrent and I have no money left to pay for dialysis, no money left to pay for heart surgery. So it's a balancing act, but we try our best to try to fill as many vacancies as humanly possible. So, so what happens to new people who graduate as nurses? Where, what happens to them? Where do they go? We try to absorb as many of them into the public health care system based on the number of vacancies either established by the RHAs or cabinet approved. But again, it boils down to availability of funds. I have $6 billion, 40%, 60% of which currently goes to recurrent. 
only leaving me 1.2 billion to provide healthcare services to all of these people and 1.3 million people. As in any other ministry, it boils down to availability of funds. Thank you very much. Honorable Prime Minister, Rena Buru Jennings on Facebook asks, Dr. Rowley, could you explain the increase in the Senior Citizens Grant? Some seniors said they got $500 extra, not the 1000 as promised in the budget. It all depends on an evaluation. Maybe I should ask the minister to explain that. It's not a, it's, um, you have to, you're evaluated on what you already have. And then you, are, you, are, you qualify for a topping up. Minister, could you just explain that, please? This is Minister Critchlow, who is Minister of Family Services and responsible for pension. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. There is a misconception that there was a $1,000 increase in the senior citizen pension. The maximum pension remains at $3,500. We have condensed the bands into four bands. So if your income is 2,500, you can get a maximum pension of 3,500. If you are in the band of 3,501 dollars to 4,005, you can get 2,005, and it goes on like that. The maximum band is, ends at 5,500 dollars. So that person would get 5,500 dollars in pension. So the increases basically range from $1,500, $1,500. There was not an across-the-board increase. And we also need to understand the difference between the qualifying income, which maxes out at, at $5,500, and the cap. So nobody gets $6,000 in pension. The maximum is $3,500. But the cap is six thousand dollars. So if you are, if your income maxes out at five thousand five hundred, you can get five hundred dollars to take you to six thousand dollars. Okay. So I hope that explains it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Let me go again. There was not an across-the-board increase of a thousand dollars in the senior citizen pension. The maximum senior citizen pension remains $3,500. The cap was increased from $5,000 to $6,000. What this means for persons is if your income ranges between $2 and $5,500, you would get a pension from the senior citizen pension. If your, if your income is more than $5,500, for example, if it's $5,501, you would not get a pension from the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. What it has meant, however, is that there were persons previously whose qualifying income may have been a maximum of, let's say, $4,510. Because the ban may have ended there, you would not have gotten a pension. Having increased the cap, however, to $6,000, persons whose income and now in the last band of $4,500 to $5,500, you would now earn a pension under the senior citizen pension. So it is really for persons based on your qualifying income. The intention was to ensure that as many persons as possible could access the senior citizen pension. But it wasn't to increase the total quantum from $3,500. Okay? Thank you, Honorable Minister. Question from the microphone on our left. Good night, Dr. Rowley. In your report to the nation, you spoke about unemployment and that we are at roughly 6%. What my, my question tonight is, what are your plans for job creation? Did, did I say unemployment was 6%? Anyway, we have the, the program for job creation in the short and medium term is largely to create activity which would, require, which would require skills and labor of one kind or another. You would have heard me pointing to a number of developmental initiatives which you, which you usually call projects. 
on whether those projects are in housing, in infrastructure, in manufacturing. There are a number of these activities which, upon initiating them, those who are involved in those activities would require to employ people. For example, we have just had to separate a number of persons in southwest Trinidad from San Fernando all the way down to Port Fortin and surroundings. And that would have reduced the employment levels in those areas somewhat. So we have put in those areas, deliberately and otherwise, certain activities. Like I mentioned, we are moving towards getting ourselves in a position to build a dry dock at La Brie. If we do that, that activity alone will require the hands-on of various skills of a couple thousand people. We talk about an industrial park in Phoenix Park for manufacturing, where we expect to have 10 Chinese export-oriented companies. That, those companies, to do the business that they're going to be involved in, would involve people. We talk about building a number of houses, thousands of houses. To do that, you have to build the infrastructure, you have to build the houses, and all kinds of skills are involved. We talk about building roads and ports and marinas, and the, all of these construction projects require a large basket of skills supported by other off-site skills like the hardware stores, the garages, the trucks, all of these activities. And of course, in the urban areas like Port Spain and elsewhere, we are working towards improving our non-physical kinds of skill involvement. We are still working towards uh, increasing the presence of Port of Spain as a banking center, creating jobs in the financial sector. We are now um, in the process of taking over from Carry Dock the marina, which was with Clico. We are working with the liquidator to have that fall under government control so that our move into marine industry for maintenance, not only for our own vessels, but for vessels in the region to operate a, a marina there so that we can provide a service for which those kinds of skills can be drawn from those areas and elsewhere in the country. So that is one area that we're working on and in the not too distant future, um, we will announce how far we've gone with that. And of course, you would have heard us, we're saying that we're buying additional vessels that will add to our civilian and military fleet and that we have large investments in military vessels that are being poorly maintained. This initiative of going directly and frontally into the marine repair facility will do two things first. It will allow us to get fuller benefit for the equipment that we have bought in the Coast Guard and elsewhere because you are going to maintain them, because we're going to have the facilities under our control operating in a business environment that the government can encourage. And of course, to do so, we will have to train up people, some of which are already trained already, and provide um, opportunities for their jobs and so on. So all of these activities have the effect of making a demand for more bodies. We talk about agriculture, just east of us here in, in, in a repo. We have a thousand acres of land in a repo there, virtually doing next to nothing now in the public sector, where a handful of public servants are uh, mining a handful of cattle. But a thousand acres of land properly farmed, properly funded, properly managed, could create a large number of jobs while producing a significant amount of beef or milk. So those are the kinds of things that we are doing, focusing on increased production, diversification of the economy, and in so doing, you're automatically making demands for bodies and hands, and that's job creation in Trinidad and Tobago. Gentleman on the microphone to the right. Good night, Dr. Rowley. Good night, everybody. Good night. My name is John Javil. I just like to get a little information on the signboards we see went up in Valencia area concerning the development of the road, the highway to Toko, and a little more information about the port in Toko. Well, I have someone here who can help all of us, Minister of Works and Transport, Minister Rohan Sinanan, who is directly responsible for that project and who uh, would be able to bring us up to date on the government's initiative to improve the infrastructure all the way to Toko as a gate, a jumping off point to Tobago, and most importantly, our effort to open up the eastern part of Trinidad 
so that those people who live in that area can have the benefit of what the rest of the country has and also that those unproductive areas up there because of improved infrastructure can now be brought in whether it is tourism whether it is agriculture whether it is uh, industry by building the infrastructure we are bringing more of the country into the national economy good night prime minister good night to all our listeners viewers and uh, citizens here at the exodus Spaniard. In terms of the signboards that went up in the Valencia area, it has been years that the Valencia, the eastern seaboard in Trinidad have been neglected. And I had brought to the cabinet statistics that showed that the unemployment in that area is at the highest in Trinidad and Tobago. Also, the salaries earned in that area is the lowest in the entire country. The, the, this government took a decision to build the port in Toku, which will open up the entire seaboard and bring Tobago closer to Trinidad. In doing that, we had to develop the infrastructure. So the Valencia to Toku Highway will basically start from the Valencia Junction. What we have done for the last year is that we have done designs for the, for the road, for the highway. But that will take some time because we have to apply for the, the EMA approvals and so. That is an ongoing process while the designs are going on. But we decided to start the construction from the Valencia roundabout because that road is in a deplorable condition and thousands of people use that road on a daily basis to get into Toko, to come out from Toko, to even to get to Port of Spain, to Arima. So the signboards you see there is that we have this, uh, broken up that project into 12 packages fourth which is about to start maybe by next week the awards are being uh, completed this week so we will actually start the Valencia to Toko Highway in that phase it, by the end of January and what that will do it will bring a lot of employment as well to the eastern seaboard we spoke about on a, about employment a little while ago that port in Toko will bring much needed high paying jobs to the people of the entire eastern seaboard. So the Ministry of Works and Transport will do its part to give you a first class infrastructure starting from by the end of January this year and continuing until the port in Toko is completed. Thank you. Question on our left. Good night to the Honorable Prime Minister and members of Cabinet. I am Iran Silcott. Minister Rohan, do go yet, as you are really come here for. <laughs> Um, I am a cultural ambassador as one of the many hats I wear, but I'll keep it short. I'll come with a thick book, you know, but I'll keep it short. No, oh, let, let, let's, let's not get carried away. We want as many people as possible to have the opportunity. Yeah. So if you're going to make a, put a question, try to keep it as tight as possible. Yes. And you won't be. Um, um, one um, advantage. Lawrence Wong Road, since 1988, we haven't had that road paved when Prime Minister Robinson was there. Minister, I would like to get that road paved. Please, thank you. My second question is, um, Jersey barricades spanning the length and breadth of the highways of Trinidad and Tobago to reduce the amount of crossover accidents we are having. When we have it, it affects traffic, it affects working ability, it affects family. I know our entire family lost, a student, a U.S. student lost her entire family with road over, crossover accidents when her parents was returning from dropping her to U.E. with her sisters and brothers as well. And Maxi Taxi, when are we going to be modernizing the Maxi Taxi industry? Our taxi badges are, it's obsolete. It could be photocopied by a primary school child who knows to operate a computer. I think Maxi Taxi operators should be given preference privilege in terms of their badges, where their taxi badges and driver's permit could be incorporated into one and could be digitally readable, right? I do um, a tour with the cruise ship that came in here and because of the regulations, I could not have communicated with my Italian guests and the technologies that I could put into my Maxi Taxi to do at all in German, French, or any other language will cost me more money than the Maxi Taxi itself if a license officer were to stop me, right? So okay. we need modernization. And I would like to invite you to take a trip from Shogona to, to Sando and experience it. We had a minister did it once before. All right, um, let me start first by the road you asked for PAVE. I just want to inform you that the ministry is going on a, 
uh, road paving exercise throughout the country because we do recognize that there are challenges with the infrastructure. In terms of the barriers, I don't know if most of you are aware, one road fatality, one death is, is too much. However, this year, well, 2018, in Trinidad and Tobago, we had the lowest road fatality in 50 years. We have been working on a plan to ensure that road safety is a top priority. And over the last three years, we were able to bring the figures down where 2018 was the lowest road fatality in 50 years. As I said before, one road fatality is one too much. We are working to get that down to zero. In terms of the, the barriers, if you would have followed the budget, you would see that the Ministry of Works and Transport did get an allocation to change the entire barriers along the highway. This is a project that is, will be going out for tender shortly. And what you will see is that the barriers on the highway, those that we have problems with, the removable ones, they'll be removed. And new barriers will be going up. New concrete barriers will be going up along the highway, the entire highway. Um, in terms of your maxi taxi. Yeah, modernization for right. maxi taxi. You would recognize that the license office is going through a lot of changes. We are using technology. And one of the areas that we focus in on is the taxi badge. In Trinidad and Tobago, you still have to go through some books that is over 50, 60 years old. And if you touch the books, the page break up. Correct, I have seen it. Right, so we are going through that, that, that exercise where we fully computerize in license office and very soon getting your taxi badge and the renewals and so will be in real time. I give you the assurance, just give us a little time and you will see some major changes at the license office. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Next Prime Minister. Question on the left. Yeah. Good night, Mr. Kitrouli. Right, My sorry. name is Marlene Good Rollins. night to you, Marlene. And I come here to tell you about the social development. I applied since 2014 for social development, and they said that yeah, they, they get approved, but the government don't have any money. I wanted to state why. What did you apply for? For the, the grant to fix the roof. And oh. they approve it. And I didn't get, they say the government have no money. I keep going up and down. Yeah. Right? The second point, Mr. Kit Rowley, is Dr. Kit Rowley. You, know, you, know, you talk to me. You don't worry. Yes, Mr. Talk Kit to Rowley. Me. The second point is the crime in the country, out of hand, yes, we know, but we're looking for you to give the opinion. I don't like how um, Gary Griffith said to shoot, to kill the youth, knowing the youth, knowing people commit crime as sick people. Mm -hmm. You supposed to give. Hold on. Right. We looking at you to, to give us our opinion how to deal with the crime situation because if a man do a crime, he's supposed to end up in the prison and your police force killing them. Yeah, we don't like it. And then again, the third. Okay, let, let, let her finish. Your last question. Keep it short. Yeah, the last one, the fireworks, Mr. Rowley. We wanted to deal with the fireworks at very out of hand. Especially when you don't take part, you have to come out the road and look at your house before they, before they catch it a fire. When you do, like, come out in the yard because all the fireworks end up in your yard. It's very out of hand. Okay, so, that, that's a lot for one person. You give this yeah, a basket yeah. full. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Give a, you got your quota here. You, you, you put three things out there. The first one, let's do the last one first. Fireworks, there are laws regulating the acquisition and use of fireworks. And as a matter of fact, those laws are very stringent. What we have been experiencing, not only with fireworks, but in our general conduct across this country, there is not sufficient effective law enforcement. Persons who set off fireworks, 